and uh, I've just introduced David Martin. So We've been invited to talk really about uh, the community element uh, with HERs, essentially. <coughs> and so David Martin is, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself, David, but essentially David is one of our community partners within, Brist within Bristol City. Um, just to just backtrack a little bit of who I am. So I am currently the Principal Historic Environment Officer for Bristol City Council. I work in a multidisciplinary team within the planning department. Uh, so I work alongside urban designers, conservation officers, landscape architects, public art officers, and these sorts of people. Um, so I actually manage conservation officers and archaeological officers, which is, uh, I think, of absolute immense value for us as a service. And urban design officers also incredibly valuable. One of the things I was going to say is about historic environment records. It's a fact of finding what those are, actually. And I think sometimes we have to rethink the definition of what an HCR is, I think. Um, I think, really, if you look at the National Planning Policy Framework, that is instructing us to demonstrate an understanding of place. And if anything's going to give you an understanding of place, it's an HCR, I would argue. Now, if we're going to get that understanding of place, we need to get that data. And that means we've got to wrestle with, the we've got to tackle big data. When I inherited the HCR in Bristol, we had 4,000 monuments for the whole city. Now, I think that's a, that's a nonsense. How can you have a city of a half a million people and you ha only have 4,000 historic monuments? Everything you see around you has some people to the historic environment, which means everything has to, should have a monument on there. So when Emily mentioned dirty data, I don't think there is anything, there's no, no perfect data. It just doesn't, there isn't, it isn't there. So we have, once you've accepted that point, it's about the data structures, which you've just been hearing about, getting those right, so you can absorb that data and manage that data. And one of the things I would have said earlier, if you're talking about place, that means that data is spatial. So we're talking about GIS data, and we need to enable people to interact with that and learn about their place and demonstrate an understanding if we want to create quality places. Now, assuming we've got 4,000 monuments on our HCR in Bristol, how do we collect more information about place? How do we enable that to happen? People who live in these places, it's not just the physical fabric, it's also the people who are living in that historic environment, they're the people who probably know more about it than I ever will. And I need to enable them to engage with the whole system, with the HER, and as soon as I go to a community group and say, have you heard about the historic environment record? They'll say, what on earth is that? They do not know. But if you change that attitude, you change that perception, and you start giving them a, a flashy, whizzy website, with old maps on and things like that, they immediately start to talk about, oh, I remember this, that, and the other. And you start to understand place a bit better. Now, I'm not saying that's what, how David's interacting with it, but rather than hear me talk about it, I think it's, it's good to hear it from the user's point of view about how you use this website and building that understanding of place, which is what I'm hoping David's going to talk about, but I haven't heard what he's going to talk about, so... <laughs> Right, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, give most of the, uh, the talk sitting at the computer, so you'll have to uh, uh, bear with me. Um, the, the website interface is called Know Your Place. Um, it's a map-based interface. Um, it obviously assumes that members of the public do have some ability to be able to navigate maps uh, there are also aerial photographs, um, an aerial photograph layer. So it, it has many sort of similarities with uh, more familiar websites like, like Google Earth, which people are, are much more um, frequently using these days. Um, the website, Know Your Place, as you open it, looks very much like this. So if you, uh, if you can't actually see the screen, I'd recommend you... Uh, Move in a little. It opens at a, a full-scale map of the whole of Bristol. Uh, and as you can see, um, on this map there are hundreds and hundreds of little diamonds. Now, each one of those represents at least one item of historical data. The actual layer that it opens up on is the, the community layer. So each one of those diamonds on this layer shows community <coughs> input into the uh, historical, um, historical environment record. 
On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see just some of the sets of data that are available through this website. I mean, the first set there is the, the city archive collections. Uh, those include the Bristol Records Office collections, the Bristol Museum and Art Gallery collections, and the Bristol Library collections. So those are all major collections which, if you were starting out from scratch, you'd have to visit each one of those independently to be able to access a lot of that data. A lot of the data in each of those sections has been uh, collected, digitised, and put onto Know Your Place through volunteer schemes. So, for example, if we swap from the community layer, so we, we untick that, drop on to the Vaughan Postcards, oops, sorry, Vaughan Postcards collection. Now, each one of those purple dots represents a photographic image, or a postcard image, rather, from the Bristol Records Office that's been scanned in by volunteers, uh, and each of those has, has had information added to it. So we will zoom in now. So two and a half thousand of those, and the community layer, that's over a thousand, just from the community layer, two and a half thousand of them. That's in addition to the four thousand monuments, so that's already more than three and a half thousand additional bits of information that's been added to our database through this project, just from those two layers. I'm coming at this from a filter of uh, this particular part of Bristol, which is the, the King's Western Estate. Um, I'm, I lead uh, a heritage group, the King's Western Action Group. Um, so we've been co collecting an awful lot of historic information, which has previously been in, in lots of different collections, whether it be private or within public collections. Uh, and I've put some, uh, some leaflets on the table, which... Um, describe a bit more about the King's Western Action Group. So, as I said, any one of those diamonds you can click on and will give you <coughs> that postcard with a bit of research, community research information underneath it and will form part of the, the heritage environment record. Uh, and I believe the... Uh, Bristol Record Office reference number is there also. And it links through to the Bristol reference of Bristol Record Office catalogue on the view online on the catalogue. It will take you through to the original record from that point as well. <coughs> Slipped a little bit. As well as those collections, it has more of the, the traditional uh, historic environment record data. So it, uh, it has a, a layer called Monuments, which is all of the, the historic environment record data put in and geographically referenced to its correct location. So any one of these little dots, again, it'll bring up the text from the, the, uh, the standard historic environment record uh, description. But also, uh, increasingly now, the, uh, there are archaeological reports available, or, or the, um, the location of a historic, a historic archaeological investigation within the database as well. So each one of these little icons represents either uh, just the description or, or the, the basic findings of what was found, or if it's a little red one, it'll actually give you a, a PDF of the, um, the archaeological report. As a member of the public, a lot of that information is, is slightly beyond... Um, a lot of people's understanding. Uh, where Heritage, uh, where um, Know Your Place comes into its own is, is really the ability to take that standard ordnance survey map. And on the right hand side, you'll see there's this list of other maps. Now, there are a lot of uh, websites available where you can access different historic maps. Uh, I think. Um, oldmaps.co.uk is a sort of fairly relati uh, relatively well-used one, and, and various other museums or different archives that have map information. But this, is, this, this gives you the ability to have all of those historic maps in a traditional map regression stacked up and geographically referenced into the Ordnance Survey map. 
For this particular area, um, we don't have many of the earlier maps, but we, we, we stop uh, 1880s, uh, which is the, the first sort of detailed ordnance survey maps. But for other areas, the city centre areas, there are maps that are 1750, 1728. So you can get a, a complete record, a transition, <laughs> geographically referenced maps through uh, 300 years worth. So, for example, that's the, that's the 1880s Ordnance Survey, 1900s, 1946 Aerial Survey, 1949 Ordnance Survey, and then, for those who have difficulty with maps, uh, an aerial photo uh, or an aerial survey, uh, a modern aerial survey, is a lot easier for people to, to navigate. So, if I just go back to the, the basic... Ordnance Survey, and I can show you a little bit more about how the community contributes to this database. Go back to the, the community layer, it'll come up in a second. Any reason it's... Uh Why internet websites only ever as good as the connection you've got to the yeah. server. <laughs> As the King's Western Action Group, the way we've been using the, the Know Your Place website is oh, here we go. Is if we if we identify an historic feature that we know hasn't been discovered before or hasn't been really understood, we can use this to put something on, and we, we have full knowledge that if you put it on here, then we know that immediately it gets recognition. Uh, it'll go across Pete's desk, Pete will uh, approve what we're putting on, and um, immediately that gives us a sense of uh, reassurance that this, this monument can be protected in the future. Just on that, it immediately becomes a material consideration within the planning process, because it is therefore part of the HER. So it's, it's a material consideration straight away from David <clears throat> So this is, this is an example I'll use, and this is a, an 18th century viewing terrace, which we'd identified on, on plans that we'd, we'd discovered. Uh, as King's Western Action Group, we went out as a volunteer group. We looked at this vast hedge of brambles, cleared them all away, and what we discovered was that we had this, this 18th century viewing terrace in a relatively good state of preservation. So uh, initially, we just uh, took a photograph of the, um, the asset uh, and then came up with a, a very brief description based on the research that we'd already done. We completed that, then submitted it, and now it's part of the heritage, uh, part of the HER. Uh, slightly later, uh, a development of Know Your Place uh, gave us the ability to put something in as a local, or, or, or submit it as a local listed building or structure. So anything as a, a blue diamond is a nomination for something as, as, as going on to the, uh, the local list. Uh, and we, we had to come up with a separate um, item for this particular nomination, but we felt it was important uh, to at least have it nominated for the local list. So whether or not there were two or more um, pieces of community data available, it didn't really matter so long as it was all forming part of that, um, that database. It's very easy to contribute to this. On the left-hand side, you'll see there's an Explore uh, and a Contribute button. It asks you to enter the location for the, uh, the, the thing that you, you'd like to enter. You simply click on the site, uh, go to an advanced form, and it'll ask you to, to name the feature, uh, there's a drop-down box asking you for the, the type of asset, so whether it's residential, industrial, other structure. A description, and a lot of the information may duplicate stuff that is already there on different layers, but I think it's important that it adds to something rather than, uh, than not putting it on at all. It also asks if there's a risk to the asset. Um, there's a drop-down list for whether you want to nominate it for the local list, uh, and increasingly we've been doing that to, uh, to try and raise the profile of certain features on the site, which have previously been, uh, been overlooked. 
You can add a photograph of the asset, uh, and if I had more time, I'd, I'd lead you through a demonstration of how that uh, how that could to, could work out. And then gives you the uh, the option of putting your name, your organisation, and your your contact detail um, if Pete or, or um, Heritage. Yeah, that, that team. form is a form for our database that goes straight into our database. Although it's a a, a non-published layer of the database, it goes straight in and not. The reason for asking the contact details is that it's subject to data protection, um, but we make it clear that we will only contact David or whoever has uploaded that information if there's a query about that record, and primarily that's about copyright of the image. If we don't feel you've got permission to upload that image, we will query that and come back to you about that, and that's usually the questions. When we set this up, and I was talking to a colleagues, HDR colleagues, they're saying, a museum colleagues saying, Pete, you are opening yourselves up to the big data problem. So essentially what they're saying, you're going to open yourself up for abuse. I've only actually rejected probably a mere handful, out of over a thousand contributions to the site, a mere handful have I actually rejected. And that's usually because someone's just typed in a bit of dog poo here or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's where, and just to point out, in terms of tools, engagement tools, Literally yesterday, we went live with a new version of the site which runs on tablets, mobile phones, and everything. And so this will actually is GPS enabled, so you can actually walk around on you know, the historic map if you chose, uh, because it's got a little blue spot where you're stood. Obviously, I'm, you're not going to find me because this is Bristol and really hard. But, um, <laughs> but if you want to see, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is just find the pools in the audience as our other people from Gloucestershire and Gloucester. Um, this is expanding to the region now as well, thanks to a Heritage Lottery funded application. So it's going to cover Gloucestershire, Somerset, and Wiltshire in the very near, well, near future. Two years it's going to take ahead of that. Thank you, both of you. Thank you.